Everyone wants to go to heaven when they die, but that's not the end of the story. When we read the New Testament through Jewish eyes, it paints a far more detailed picture of our final destiny. After a short sojourn in paradise, we will experience resurrection from the dead, the messianic kingdom, and an even greater epoch to follow, the world to come. Messiah Podcast is brought to you by First Fruits of Zion, providing messianic Jewish teaching for Christians and Jews. Put your hand and mind together. We will walk in harmony. Let me introduce you to my teacher, the rabbi from the Galilee. Well, welcome back to Messiah Podcast Selects, where Jesus is Jewish and that changes everything. My name is Jacob Franzak. I'm here with my co-host, Damian Eisner, the director of Torah Club. How are you doing, Damian? Shalom and howdy. Wonderful. How are you? Oh, man. You know, it's fine. It's raining finally, so I don't have to go hand water any of my uh, garden plants today. So we're thankful for that. Very nice. Always nice when Hashem opens opens the skies. Yeah. Yeah. So this week, we're uh, it's a selects week, so we're reading an article. And the article is called Afterlife, Kingdom, and the World to Come. It's from this past issue of Messiah Magazine, and it's by our colleague Aaron Eby, the director of Vine of David. And this article, I think, really helps bring out a lot of detail about the destinies of our souls or like the end times, what what eventually happens. And we've talked a lot recently about the, uh, on the podcast about what happens to our souls right after we die. Right. But right, then right. there's a whole lot of stuff that happens after that, you know, like dying and going to heaven isn't the end of the story by any means there's a whole bunch of other stuff afterward it's not i thought i thought that was i thought heaven is the end of the story no oh okay <laughs> did you well, we, we should talk about this because you know it's see, like everyone loves revelation and and prophecy and end times and everyone loves to try to figure out the apocalyptic literature i love this stuff what happens not actually when we die although you're right we've had some fantastic discussions about NDEs and all that kind of good stuff. But what happens next is where it gets really, really interesting. And, you know, there's there's a lot to talk about, but there's not a lot revealed in the biblical text, which makes that open to a lot of interpretation. Oh, yeah. And people have pieced these, uh, these puzzle pieces together in a lot of different ways. And a lot of it has been without any reference to the broader body of Jewish literature right. that we know the New Testament is is part of. So getting that context is going to be crucial, and Aaron's going to help us out with that in this article. Well, let's hear what Aaron has to say, because I'm excited. Absolutely. If you want to know the Jewish Jesus, don't miss out on a free subscription to Messiah Magazine, where you'll discover his life and teaching, learn about the biblical festivals, and get connected with Israel. Subscribe for free at messiahmagazine.org. Messiah Magazine is a free, donation-supported quarterly publication of First Fruits of Zion. Afterlife, Kingdom, and the World to Come by Aaron Eby Our generation might be the one to see it. The Messiah invading the skies on the clouds of heaven, flashing like lightning from the east to the west, his feet alighting upon the Mount of Olives. However, dare I say it, our lives might end like those of our ancestors. We pray, we long, we strive every day for the fulfillment of God's promises. In the end, our children lower us into the earth with that same unsatisfied longing in their hearts. Consider the fathers and mothers of our faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. They pioneered faith in God in an otherwise dark and barbaric world. At every turn of their lives, God repeated his promises to them, and they went to the grave still treasuring those unfulfilled promises. When we die, our souls depart this world. 
The Bible promises that at the end of days, the earth will experience a flurry of divine intervention, some frightening, some exhilarating. As terrifying as the apocalypse sounds, there will be something satisfying about it. Imagine experiencing firsthand the culmination of everything and the proof that what you strived for was real and worth it. God made grand covenants and assurances, and he caused his people to suffer and strive for them. It would not be fair to deny them the satisfaction of seeing it all come together. Accordingly, we have faith that in the afterlife, we will be able to observe God's plan as it unfolds. Will we be detached observers peering down from heaven as if watching a baseball game from the grandstands? The Jewish faith tradition and the New Testament answer this question in one accord. The faithful overcomers of ages past will not be in the nosebleed section. They will have front row seats. This is because the coming of the kingdom of heaven will include one of the greatest displays of God's power, the resurrection of the dead. The Cosmic Timeline The Jewish sages divided the cosmic timeline into segments based on their reading of scripture. The life we are currently experiencing is known as this world or this age. As Jesus said when contrasting our current time with the future, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, Luke 20, 34. In a basic sense, everything beyond our current experience can be called the next world or the world to come. However, the future holds many changes in store. This means that the phrase the world to come might ambiguously refer to any of the various stages in the future. Judaism teaches that the soul departs from the body and remains conscious when a person dies. The soul of one who is righteous arrives at a world of blissful rest with other disembodied souls. This world of souls is called paradise or the Garden of Eden. Jesus used this standard Jewish terminology when he told the thief on the cross, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise, Luke 23, 43. Jesus was speaking about the same place in his story in which a poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side, Luke 16, 22. This is another standard Jewish term for the world of souls. Humans live and die and the world goes on, but it won't go on as it is forever. According to the traditional Jewish timeline, the Messiah's coming will initiate a series of dramatic changes. Again, Jesus used typical Jewish terminology when he referred to this tumultuous transition as birth pains, Matthew 24, 8 and Mark 13, 8. When the dust settles, the earth will experience a time of rest, peace, and prosperity. The whole world will submit to King Messiah, and Israel will finally receive all that God promised to her. Most Jewish sources describe this period as lasting a thousand years, and the New Testament confirms this, Revelation 20, 2-7. Jesus referred to this period as the kingdom of heaven, but the sages more commonly spoke of it as the days of Messiah, or the Messianic age. According to Jewish teaching, after that millennium passes, God will replace the world as we know it with a new heaven and new earth. The new world will be so different from our current experience that it is impossible to imagine or describe in concrete terms. It will last for eternity. In summary, we have three major worlds ahead of us, paradise, the kingdom of heaven, and the new heavens and new earth. Any of them can be called the world to come, although the term technically fits the final era best. A Fundamental Principle Jewish theology speaks more about duty than belief. It leaves ample and inviting space for differences of opinion and interpretation. However, Judaism has some core beliefs, and among them is faith in the resurrection of the dead. Belief in the resurrection was not unanimous in the time of the Gospels. This was a core tenet that distinguished the Pharisees from the Sadducees. That's why it was Sadducees who hassled Jesus with questions about a woman with seven husbands, Luke 20, 27-33. In their view, he represented the Pharisaic position. According to this fundamental principle of faith, the souls of the departed will return to their physical human bodies on earth. The same bodies they once had will regenerate from their remains. 
They will even have the same scars, blemishes, and disabilities they had at first, so they will be easy to identify. Note how Jesus retained his puncture wounds after his resurrection, making his identity undeniable to Thomas. Only after raising them from the dead will God also heal their afflictions. This principle is so essential to the ancient rabbis that they declared that one who does not accept it would not have a share in the future world. Simply believing that the dead will rise again is not enough. The Jewish sages taught that one must believe that the resurrection is hinted at in the Hebrew scriptures, especially the five books of Moses. Many of the prophets talk about it, but often in oblique ways. The book of Daniel is the most explicit. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Daniel 12.2 But in the Torah of Moses, it's not so clear. The ancient rabbis turned finding these subtle hints into a sort of game. For example, one rabbi pointed to Deuteronomy 32.39, I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal. You might object and say that make alive refers to newborn children and not the resurrection of the dead, but the parallelism in the verse teaches otherwise. Who does God heal? The same person he wounded. If so, who does he make alive? The same person he put to death. Another rabbi pointed to the Song of Redemption in Exodus 15.1. A typical English translation reads, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. But in Hebrew, the word sang sounds like it is in the future tense. This wording suggests that Moses and the people of Israel will sing this song at the time of the ultimate redemption. God will need to resurrect them to do that. Yet another rabbi cited the blessing Moses gave to the tribe of Reuben, let Reuben live and not die, Deuteronomy 33.6. Doesn't that seem a little redundant? Rather, we should understand the verse to mean let Reuben live in this world, and not die in the world to come. One witty sage told his fellow with a twinkle in his eye, Jacob is not dead. As proof of his claim, he quoted the verse, Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from far away and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jeremiah 30, 10. If God told Jacob, I will save you and your offspring, it stands to reason that Jacob is still alive. Jesus participated in this interpretation game when he responded to the Sadducees. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Luke 20, 37 and 38. Heaven for Eternity At one point, Paul had to respond harshly to resurrection deniers among the ranks of the believers. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? 1 Corinthians 15.12 In other words, the resurrection of Jesus is proof of the general resurrection in the future. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, 1 Corinthians 15.20. The resurrection raises complications for those who expect to spend eternity in heaven. One might suggest that God gives us our resurrection bodies in heaven, but that is not how the Jewish community has ever perceived resurrection. Rather, the same body that dies is the body that comes to life. Paul compared the body to a seed that is planted, dies, and rises from the ground, 1 Corinthians 15, 36 and 37. Consistent with Jewish tradition, he describes the resurrection as happening at the time of the end. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. Once we accept that there is a physical end times resurrection of our bodies from the earth, only the Jewish concept of paradise makes sense. There must be such a temporary holding place for disembodied souls. Two Resurrections Although resurrection itself is a core idea in Jewish thought, not everyone agrees on the details. Some rabbis have insisted that it must occur at the beginning of the Messianic era. That way the righteous can enjoy firsthand the promises of God coming to pass. Others have claimed that it must happen at the end of the Messianic era when God judges the dead. 
Finally, some rabbis proclaim both ideas are right. The righteous come to life first, and the rest wait until the final judgment. The book of Revelation confirms the double resurrection perspective. John speaks of the souls of martyrs and those who stayed faithful to the testimony of Jesus and the word of God. These souls came to life at the beginning of the Messianic era. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Revelation 20, 5 and 6. The Didache, an early apostolic text, also maintains the position that the righteous enjoy an early resurrection. In classic rabbinic style, the teaching bases this on the proof text. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. Zechariah 14, 5. The two resurrections reflect the two purposes they serve. The resurrection allows God to fulfill his promises to the faithful in every generation who died clutching those promises. It is not just their descendants who will enjoy the fruit of their hope, but each generation for themselves. The resurrection is necessary for the judgment of the wicked, since both the body and the soul were accomplices in their wickedness. The rabbis explain this with a parable. A blind man and a lame man hatched a scheme to steal fruit from the king's orchard. The blind man set the lame man on his shoulders, and together they filled their baskets. The king caught on to their crime, but they each denied responsibility. How can a blind man see fruit to steal? How can a lame man reach it? The king set the lame man on the blind man's shoulders and judged the two as one man. So it is with our body and our soul. One cannot sin without the other's participation. Both are subject to judgment. The Satisfying Conclusion The chronology of the resurrection and the end times can be confusing, as we must piece together many small hints and allusions. Fortunately, the Jewish context brings continuity and coherence to many issues like this. To make sense of the redemption era and afterlife, we should start by learning the basic Jewish framework of life after death. We can supplement, correct, and clarify this perspective through the details provided in the New Testament. This approach does not diminish the New Testament. By plugging it into its source and context, we give it the power to instruct as it was meant to do. Knowing that there is a real resurrection of the dead should strike both hope and a holy fear in us. We have hope knowing that the sacrifices we make in this life are worthwhile. We also gain a sense of fear knowing that God will hold us accountable for our actions. It is critical that we live our lives in anticipation of the resurrection of the dead. As an added benefit, we get to enjoy the continuity of Scripture and the satisfaction of knowing a God who keeps promises. Live life today in preparation for the resurrection, and you can rest assured that you will be right in the thick of the action when it comes. You will one day awaken to a trumpet, rub the dirt out of your eyes, and experience the most satisfying conclusion to the greatest story of all time. Torah Club is the world's fastest growing Messianic Jewish Bible study. You can start or join a club today at TorahClub.org. Know Jesus better through an in-depth small group Bible study and fellowship with other like-minded disciples. Start a club or join a club at TorahClub.org. Torah Club is where disciples learn. Fascinating, revelatory, good stuff as usual. I had this thought, though. You know, the Torah speaks against tattooing one's body oh yeah and there's this sort of funny joke about people who get tattoos that you know sometime as they age that as things begin to you know sag and loosen up Mm -hmm. wow they're going to really regret that tattoo now i understand the torah they are going to have that tattoo eternally who knows what it's going to look like in you know four hundred thousand years in eternity Oh, Gosh, man. it all makes sense because we're being resurrected with everything we had in this life. Oh no, better take care. Just a, yeah. just a, just a good article. Really good. Well, I wonder about that though, because like, uh, 
the the rabbis say that God will heal, like if someone is is blind, that God right. will heal them after the resurrection. I wonder if the tattoo counts as like a self inflicted wound, and God probably. would yeah would heal probably. It. Man, yeah, I know some people do not want to walk around with those in eternity. Yeah. And there, yeah. there is a little bit, I mean, I know that th- in the article it talks about, there, there is a little, there is some difference of opinion, big surprise, right, in, in rabbinic literature about whether or not you actually, if you're healed in exactly the same condition in which you died, I believe, right? Like if you have a severed hand or, you know, something or other, and it, it God puts it back together for you. You know, oh, I don't know. About? I just read, I just read this the other day in Midrash Tanchuma and it just, it said basically what Aaron said in the article, which is yeah. you get, you come back with whatever problems you had and then God heals you. But I don't know if it was specific as to different, like, uh, I mean, it just sounded to me like you, you'd get restored to, uh, your ideal state there. Yeah. Well, again, I, I hope so. I, I if, if someone had lost a leg, uh, who wants to be in the, in the kingdom or the world to come with one leg. So I, I believe firmly that we'll have a full restoration at some point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you it would have to be who's no one's God's not gonna make anyone hop around the afterlife on one <laughs> leg. That's so I grew up, I grew up in, uh, in the church. My parents were, were Christians and I, you know, it got, saved at like four years old in the back of a, a sedan. And so I grew up hearing about all this stuff, uh, just not at a very high level, you know, not, not, not the details. Wait, I, I remember- did you just say, did you just say in the back of a sedan? Yeah. Did yeah. I'm a Christian in the back of a sedan. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was asking my parents, it was like four years old. We li- we were living in California oh. and I was asking my parents about, um, you know, what, what, what is this salvation thing? What is this, what does it mean to be, to be saved? And okay. so they explained it to me. Needed yeah. that clarification. I got it. So I remember growing up just thinking, you know, once, once, when, once you die, you go to heaven. Like when grandma, when grandma died, it's like, oh, grandma's in heaven now. And then when you die, you'll go to heaven. And I didn't hear too much about uh, dead bodies coming back to life until uh, my dad got into these prophecy conferences and these dis- dispensationalist teachers that were talking about the rapture and mm-hmm. the, the resurrection, the physical resurrection of the dead was kind of a footnote. But it had to be there because all these verses that talk about it, you know, Paul says that, uh, talks about the rapture, he says the dead in Christ will rise first, right? And so you, there's that physical resurrection right there in the New Testament. But that was like the first I heard of it. Was it the same for you? Did you hear about this going to heaven forever thing before you heard about the bodily resurrection from the dead? I could not be further from the experience you just shared growing up in a traditional Jewish home. We oh. never we never talked about that. I mean, we didn't talk about going to heaven or or what happens when you die. I mean, it's just not a common it's just not a common conversation and interestingly, even though it is a very ancient Jewish idea, um, it was not until I became a disciple of Yeshua that I even considered such a thing, because that's where I first really encountered it, was reading through the Gospels and the Apostolic texts. So, very different. But since then, believe me, I've thought a lot about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I th- so maybe that's just like a, like a, a, a problem that christians have if they don't read the bible really closely because i was i was looking at this because i was i was thinking why didn't i hear about the bodily resurrection of the dead until i got a little older and you know it's like it's in the apostles creed it's in the nicene creed it's in the athanasian creed they all have the resurrection the bodily resurrection of the dead in there so i think it it's first of all it's a little weird that people don't talk about it very much in in christian circles but like second of all i wonder if the problem is sort of the same problem as thinking an angel is like a little naked baby or something. It's just this, these popular ideas, uh, uh, just get circulated more than actual theology. I don't know. Well, let's think about that for a second, because I don't know if it is, I don't know if it's very confusing if you, you know, the idea of, Hey, um, when you, if you say this prayer and you believe that Jesus is the Messiah and you let him into your heart, then when you die, you're going to go to a very, very nice place and you're going to live there forever and forget about floating on clouds and angels, you know, just like a real picture of, of being with God forever. That compared to 
hey, listen, if you do this and believe this, you're going to be resurrected into your very same body and be able to live on earth uh, you know, for a thousand years and then some other great stuff is going to happen. It's a much easier, and I'm not, I don't say this like with, with sarcasm or condescension in any way, but it's a much easier sell to say, you're going to go to heaven. Like your soul is going to just depart and you're going to go to heaven. So I think that is a, a fairly large contributor to why the resurrection is not really talked about. It's, it's your it's your body, like your body yeah. coming back. Yeah. No, and I think you I think you nailed something there, which is that a lot of us, um, myself included, who who uh came into evangelical Christianity, whether you grew up in it or whether um you you came into it later in life, um, you know, we all got the talk, we all got the Romans road or the four spiritual laws or something. We got the most condensed possible like the least information that someone needs to make a decision to follow Jesus. And what these evangelists think, and I know because I've been on mission trips and stuff, is what we think is, well, you know, these people will follow up with local churches and they'll go to church and eventually they'll get the rest. I, you know, that I think a lot of people do. Um, and I think a lot of people probably don't, you know, I mean, it's a big yeah. commitment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I don't know, this is, a, this may be, too far out there and random too, but the body, the natural body. And, and I remember talking with Jen Rosner about this in the, in our podcast with her about how much, you know, emphasis Judaism places on your natural body and on this world and on that, that chapter in her book that was called bodies. That's, that too, I think, is more of a Jewish thought process. You know, if you if you think back to Plato and the boys, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone, Plato, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, the uh, the old bearded men who 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 figured everything out, or thought they thought they figured everything out, and, and who thought that your body was a prison cell. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, it was an it was an utterly disgusting thought in Greek philosoph in Greek philosophy that you would ever like hold on to this body who in the world would want that the immortal soul yes and that 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 we we can see that development through that early early greek philosophy of of a uh, concept of immortal soul but disgusting that we would ever have anything to do with this um this there's a there's a phrase i can't rem it's it's soma sema or Soma Sima, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but that that thought was a body, a tomb. Mm. This yeah, is yeah. a prison. We want to shake this thing off. We don't need this. This is not our our essence. And that's true. But the, the older I get, man, though, I mean, I can see the, you, the picture I have of Plato in my head is this really old dude. And I could definitely see someone saying, got to get rid of this thing, man. <laughs> my well, knees yeah, hurt. My true. back hurts. I got a headache. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But I think that, you know, there's a, there's a, and, and we were talking recently, I don't remember when we had this chat about the Gnostics mm. and, and that kind of flowed down to them, right? Yeah. So like Christianity, um, we, it's easy to look back and see, and all churches do this, by the way, they have this sort of timeline going all the way back to the apostles and they handed down the exact truth of their doctrine of their denomination to the next generation. And, and, and this is where it all came from. Um, but what you don't see is the whole branching tree of all the other weird stuff that, um, that people believed. I mean, uh, and the Gnostics were, were probably more than one group that came out of real early, uh, um, communities of believers mm -hmm. who, who, who took these Platonic ideas seriously. That's sort of how they looked. They, they, they saw everything in the New Testament through that lens. And they were very disinterested in this whole uh, idea of the physical body. They were, they were far more interested in the eternal soul, the spiritual, um, not just the physical body, but the physical world. The Gnostic idea is that the, the physical world was created by kind of an idiot, like this bad guy, this, mm -hmm. this uh, demiurge, right? Mm -hmm. And that that Jesus came from some better God who who doesn't have a physical body, and they didn't they thought Jesus didn't have a physical body, 
and they thought you know the, the ideal for them would be to get rid of the of the physical body so that yeah. uh, so they didn't want the resurrection from the dead but i think what a lot of people don't realize is just how close uh, christianity came to being that mm-hmm. like cuz marcion this the, the marcion heresy you know this gnostic heresy this guy was incredibly influential and you see a lot of these early creeds the nicene creed the, the chalcedonian creed the uh, athanasian creed are meant to refute these they were called we call them heresies now that had become very popular and marcion in his Gnosticism, he, what he wanted to do was get rid of the whole Old Testament. He wanted to rewrite the the, the, the he Gospels, and he wanted to 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 eliminate the anything that was physical or or that made it sound like the physical world was good and and that we were going to stick around here. Yeah, and you know, thank God. I mean, Baruch Hashem, that he was you know excommunicated, or we would we would have lost all of our contact with our jewish roots and we we wouldn't be sitting here today talking about it that's right that's right the western influence all of the discussion about the soul and the body really we we really begin to see so much of it developing after plato and the boys and and the rabbis you know there's it's funny judaism talks about the influence of of Jewish thought on the Greek philosophers. Yeah. Yeah, I think Philo might be the guy who who talked about that like uh, Moses Moses going to uh, or somehow the the Greeks got their hands on some Moses and and that's where they got all their spiritual right. ideas that were any, that were any good. It's a it's a very Jewish way of looking at it, but throughout that time period from Plato and on, we we arrive into this su- such the interesting period of time in the in the late Second Temple period, Yeshua's period, and and the uh, apocalyptic writing period, Roman oppression period, suffering of the righteous develops in in really well articulated form. We're seeing that over this time period. Uh, how. There's got to be more than this stinky old life where we are being treated badly and, you know, surely God has to have more in store. And so we really see in those ap- apocalyptic writings and then, of course, through, through thoroughly developed through rabbinic literature, the resurrection coming into its fullest form all around Yeshua and the apostles. I mean, they were immersed in this. And so it is absolutely no surprise at all that we see Yeshua, um, you know, that's this, I mean, I'm sorry, Paul talking so much about what's next. It's Mm -hmm. not, it's not a Christian thought. That's the amazing point I'm trying to make here. Right. It's a, it's a Jewish thought. Yeah. A, as a matter of fact, a Pharisaic thought. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting to realize that there were there were these Jewish people, the Sadducees, who didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the afterlife, and critically, they didn't believe in reward and punishment uh, on, on like a personal level. Which, if you think about it, all kinds of, uh, it goes together with uh, the rest of what the Sadducees did, which was uh, you know, but uh, just basically uh, work for the Romans, collect money from uh, temple tax, um, and. You know who cares about anyone else? Because you don't. You know, might as well eat, drink, and be merry, right? If uh, if there's no reward or punishment in the afterlife, sure. And but you know what is also really interesting is that the Sadducean position was derived in large part from their um, connection to only the written text. Hmm. In other words. The Bible is relatively quiet about what comes next and about the resurrection. And, you know, we mentioned Daniel and we're talking about the rabbis uh, and Isaiah. There are some some vague references in Psalms, but there are Job, Ecclesiastes, the Psalms. You see a lot of interesting things there that that one could almost arrive at the conclusion that that uh, this is the end. Like that when it's over, you go down to Sheol and there it is and the, hope you had a nice life. Yeah, yeah. So, and Aaron talks about that in the article about how rabbis 
uh, tried to find the resurrection in the Torah, in the first five books of the Bible, right. and how it, it became sort of an, an interpretation game. And I was thinking about that, like, you know, Moses in Jewish tradition is the prophet who saw the clearest. He had the clearest, like, communication from God. God spoke yeah. to him um, mouth to mouth, I think, is is what it says, which is funny because you think it would be mouth to ear. But God spoke to him more clearly, and, you know, all of the prophets dreamed dreams and saw visions, but Moses face to face. So you would think, or you might ask, you know, wouldn't it be, would, wouldn't God tell Moses about this great resurrection thing? Like, Hey, by the way, you can tell the, tell the, tell the Jewish people, uh, that they're going to come back to life at, and there's going to be this awesome final redemption, not just a national redemption, but personal resurrection for each, uh, mm-hmm. for each one of them. How come that didn't make it into the uh, Torah, Damien? Well, great question. Um, there are, <laughs> Is is that for this podcast? Is that where we're headed on this one? Oh, you you, yeah. you don't have to answer it if it's a uh, if it's too hard. Well, I think there was a bigger problem that uh, was happening for Israel. It is a hard question, by the way. You really are putting me on the spot. But what we read time and time again is, hey, here's this great thing called the Torah, and you should do these great things, and you're going to be rewarded. Where in this life, choose life right? Hmm. Choose blessing, choose life, not death, not curse. And then, but then the Torah goes on to tell the story of how they indeed did, as history has certainly proven. Uh, Israel chose wrong. And then the story is about what? Going to heaven? I'm going to bring you, uh, you know, don't worry about it. It's all going to work out. You're going to end up in heaven. That's not at all what the story is. What is the story? What's the conclusion in Deuteronomy, Jacob? I flip it back to you, my brother. Well, in Deuter- the conclusion in Deuteronomy um, is that the the nation's going to be redeemed. The nation's going to be, be brought back into their land, and and God's going to cleanse them of all the sins of their of their ancestors. It says they have to repent, but they will right. be brought back. He's going to bring them from the, the corners of the earth, no matter how far the, no matter how far they've been scattered. They're going to return to the land of Israel. Yep, into the land. Now, the interesting thing I think, which we could suggest would be uh, a neat a neat resurrection component is the circumcision of the heart you know you 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 can't get your heart circumcised very easily uh while it's in this flesh and blood body there's got to be something supernatural that happens and we have this new heart and then we move to the new covenant and we see all this awesome stuff so see what we did right there was we just played the rabbi's game we just looked through the Torah and we found some resurrection in there. Uh, yeah. But I, I love, here's, here's something that I have to say, um, which is sort of unrelated to that. It goes back to what we were talking about before, about Pharisees, Sadducees. A, a lot of times in, in Messianic Judaism, we, uh, particularly in First Roots, at First Roots of Zion, in our in our resources, in our articles, in Torah Club, we're constantly talking and referencing rabbinic literature, uh, and and the Pharisees in particular, um, and not not to the joy of everyone who hears that. You know, yeah. man, that's that's man made. You can't yeah. don't don't bring that in. That's not in the Bible. Don't do that. And so there is some criticism and some certain reluctance and resistance to that. But yeah. here is the ultimate irony. It is the Pharisees who developed the doctrine of resurrection. Hmm. It is the Pharisees who, who passed this down and got it to us. It was not well developed before these brilliant scholars of Torah and Jewish thought pulled it out of the text, saw it, put all the pieces together and said, oh my goodness, Hashem is going to work a miracle and it is the resurrection of the dead. So for all haters of the Pharisees, I'm sorry to tell you, <laughs> you be- you're, if you believe in the resurrection, you're believing in a Pharisaic doctrine, could it be? It oh, is. How Pharisaical. I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we need to re- we reclaim the uh we need to reclaim the word Pharisee. I just saw I just saw it in like a a news article the other day. Someone someone was comparing their uh 
their enemies and some weird political argument to Pharisees and scribes and hypocrites or whatever. I'm like, oh man, and it, it's, it <laughs> so, hits me like way different now that I know who the Pharisees were and that they were not just a bunch of hypocrites. Um, yeah, I know. I know. It's, it's uh, sad that people just don't know this stuff, man. Nope. Uh, and here's here's one last really cool thing that I always think of, and this this I believe is from. This was developed well in a teaching that uh, Daniel did, called "What About Heaven and Hell?" That you know the the ultimate confirmation of the Pharisaic doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. What was it? the resurrection of our Messiah. Absolutely, yeah. It shut the Sadducees down. I mean, not that not that the Pharisees were embracing it, but you know, in the big picture, that totally confirmed the the Pharisaic doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. And I love the irony within that, speaking to what you just said about people not really understanding that the Pharisaic stuff. Hmm. Yeah, well, and and maybe in an attempt to uh, answer my own question, which is why don't we find a really clear Bible verse somewhere in the Torah about um, mm-hmm. about the resurrection? Like, look, you guys are all going to come back from the dead. Uh, it made me think of this um, passage from Perkei Avot, which is in the Mishnah. It's a it's a really famous, um, probably the more, most uh, widely read book of the of the Mishnah. And chapter one, Mishnah, Mishnah three, Antigonus of Soho said this. Um, amazing thing. He said, um, in the name of uh, Shimon, he received this transmission from Shimon the Righteous. Um, Antigon- Antigonus of Soko said, Do not be as servants who serve the master to receive reward. Rather, be as servants who serve the master not to receive reward. And let the fear of heaven be upon you. Mm-hmm. Right? So the, the Torah is all about serving Hashem. And I think the, the kingdom is all about serving Hashem, right? Uh, it's good to know about the resurrection. It's good to know the, the the destiny that's in store for us, and we should understand it, and we should we should understand where these beliefs come from. However, we don't serve Hashem only because we're thinking, oh, if I serve Hashem, you know, I'll get to come back from the dead, right? The the kingdom is about serving Hashem because that's what we, that's what we're supposed to do. And I think that's sort of what the perspective in the Torah is. God, God says, I did something for you. I brought you out of Egypt. Now here's what, uh, here's what I want you to do. Yeah. Um, you know, God has done so much for us. He's given us everything and he doesn't ask that much from us. And, you know, we need to take those responsibilities seriously, right? That's, that's my attempt to answer the question. I don't know if that's correct or not. Well, I'll ask for a clarification. Are you are you saying, in essence, that there is such a thing as being so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good? You heard that before, right? It's it's possible, and I think that's why you know. I mean, you don't hear a whole lot in Judaism about final destinies and eternal things. It's all it's in there. There's tons of it, but generally, if you if you have Jewish people talking about Judaism, it's about halacha. It's about what to, what what do we do right now? The the way to serve Hashem right now, because this is our only chance after the resurrection. I mean, it's great, but it also yeah. represents the end of our chance to to make a difference, to make a change, to do teshuva, to repent, to do acts of kindness. After right. the resurrection, we can't do that anymore. We we can only do that right now. Right. Um. So in a sense, it represents you know that that's when our final exams get graded, and maybe we're not ready. <laughs> Uh, to have the finals graded, maybe we're not finished taking the test yet, and um, it, it's so like like Aaron says, it inspires a hope and also a holy fear, knowing that we're going to come back from the dead. Well, true, and again to what you asked me about how it was growing up in my home, you know, I, I, I was, it was not instilled in me that I should be fearful of, you know not being able to participate in what was next that that's mm. not a that's not a traditional jewish idea so it was sort of expected you do your absolute best in this world and i know how i know how many feathers that can ruffle to suggest that you know i'm trying to say our our 
our acts determine our place in the world to come. I'm not saying that, but I am saying very much so that Judaism is focused on this world with the expectation that you 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 do your absolute best here even though you fail and God will take care of the rest. Yeah. Yeah, well, and what you just said reminded me of this passage in the Talmud where it talks about seven kinds of Pharisees. Mm-hmm. And the last two are the Pharisee who's, who, uh, who's a Pharisee because of fear and the Pharisee who's a Pharisee because of love. Yeah. And, you know, uh, both are... Both are not bad, but it's better to to serve God out of love, and not yeah. and not just to be cowering in fear, like oh gosh, am I not good enough? But just to love Hashem and to and to trust Him and to do what you can. Yeah, yeah. And of course, this this whole discussion leads into one even more fascinating, and that is one that we're not going to have, but just as a teaser, the the ideas of of heaven and hell and Jewish thought and Christian thought. So again, I think back to to Daniel's teaching on that. That is part of the First Fruits of Zion resource catalog. So if you're interested in that, check it out. Well, thanks for tuning in to Messiah Podcast, where Jesus is Jewish and that changes everything. Hey, this article was from Messiah Magazine, issue 27. If you liked it, go ahead and get a free copy of the magazine head to ffoz.org. And we have a lot more great Messianic Jewish teaching coming your way through Messiah Podcast. So please share the podcast with your friends. We appreciate you being here. We will talk again soon. Shalom. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Messiah Podcast, where Jesus is Jewish and that changes everything. This podcast is an extension of Messiah Magazine, available at messiahmagazine.org. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a review along with a five-star rating wherever you're listening now. Today's podcast was hosted by myself, Jacob Franzak, along with Damian Eisner. Our executive producer is Boaz Michael, and the editor-in-chief is Daniel Lancaster. This episode was directed and edited by Jeremy Schoenwald. Original music was written and performed by Joshua Aaron. The show notes for Messiah Podcast were edited by Candy Bishop and are available at messiahpodcast.org. If you are interested in learning more about the Bible from a Messianic Jewish perspective, check out Torah Club which is an international network of small study groups who meet weekly to study the Bible together from a Messianic Jewish perspective. To start a club or join a club, go to TorahClub.org. Until next time, Shalom. Let his word cover you and me Like the waters cover the sea Let his love cover you and me Like the waters cover the sea